Claire Collins, and I'm a risk consultant with Presidium. Presidium is a risk management company that focuses on child sexual abuse. Our mission is simply to work with organizations so that they can protect all in their care from abuse ever occurring. What our hope today is to have a conversation really around building a culture of protection in the church. This is an important topic for me, not only because of my work with Presidium, but also because I'm an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. During my 30 years of ministry, I've served as a senior pastor, a youth minister, an advisor, a chaplain. And in that work, I know firsthand how hard this topic is. The topic of abuse, prevention, um, response, it can be overwhelming at times. Where do we start? How do we even know how to really protect all those in our care? And so my hope today is that we can embark on this conversation so that you not only understand why we have to build this uh, opportunity, but also how to start that journey, how to build that safe church. Before I get started, let me remind you that this is a webcast that is live. And so I'm here to answer your questions in real time. Use the chat feature, type in your question, and I will go ahead and, and be able to type back. But what I really want you to think about is how can you use this time to engage not only me, but maybe even each other. So share where you're from, what your ministry is. Make those connections because this is a journey that we need to be on, not only as individuals, as churches, but really together as the body of Christ. The role of the church in society is one that many believe is like a hospital. So it's for those who are sick or ill seeking healing. For some will describe it as a classroom, a place to go and to learn and to grow. And for others, they'll talk about it in the sense of a sanctuary, a refuge. For those who are in need of protection, they come and they find respite and refuge. One of my favorite quotes is from the grandson of Billy Graham, who actually has dedicated his legal career to fight sexual abuse. And he says, protecting and caring for others was a priority for Jesus Christ in his life. And it must be a priority in his church today. So let's spend a few minutes looking at the scope of the problem of child sexual abuse and why this call to build a cultural protection in the church is so important for us today. First, let's start by understanding the scope of the problem. The CDC estimates that one in four girls and one in 13 boys will experience sexual abuse before the age of 18. Let's stay there for a minute. One in four, one in 13. Think about how many people enter your church each and every day. How many people sit in the pews on Sunday morning? Let's do a little math. Let's say 200 people show up and 100 are female and 100 are male. That means that 25 women, 8 men, 33 individuals at least have or will experience sexual abuse. That's nearly 17% of the entire congregation. And if you really know the statistics, you know that only about 20% actually report abuse. So those numbers are even higher. 80% of abuse goes unreported. Why do you think that is? Probably partially because there is a lack of safe places, safe individuals to share. There's a fear that people won't be believed. There's a fear that people will be blamed. There's a fear that they're going to be sharing something about somebody who's important in their life. Because you see, 89% of all those who are perpetrators, who commit sexual abuse, are known by the victim. That's very different from the way I was raised. I was raised with the stranger danger mentality. And yet we know that only 11% of offenders are strangers. 29% are family, and 60% are community members. That's teachers, coaches, mentors, and pastors. That's the reality of who is sitting in our congregations every Sunday, who is entering our doors. We also know that as we think about our youth programming, as we think about inviting more and more families to come and be part of our church, youth to youth sexual misconduct is on a rise. It's actually hitting numbers higher than adult to youth. 
And so knowing the signs to look for this and keeping our youth engaged appropriately becomes a really important part of our conversation. And when you say, hmm, this isn't about our church, well, according to LifeWay Research, 44% of Protestant churchgoers say that they have been sexually victimized. And 12% of these instances happened within the church. It's not someone else's problem. It's our problem. Child abuse studies in Protestant churches are very few and far between, but I found a few that I really want to point out to you. And I'll share these references in the chat. But insurance claims back in 2007 showed that over 7,000 claims of sexual abuse by pastors or people in congregations and churches were reported over a 20 year span. That's over 260 claims per year. In another research study in 2018, they found in 326 cases of alleged child abuse that offenders were predominantly employees of the church, 80%. Can you imagine? 34% almost 35 were pastors, 31% youth ministers. And finally, in another investigation that I read in 2019, they looked at a number of cases across a very prominent denomination and found over 380 sexual offenders and 700 victims across 20 years. But what was really hard to believe is that 35 of those pastors who had been accused of abuse actually were hired into other churches. Obviously, the problem isn't just someone else's. The problem is ours. Thinking about how child abuse is happening in our churches is something we need to open our eyes to. We need to look at how do we want to respond? Who do we want to be? Who have we been called to be? But before I continue on, I want to mention a few other elements about abuse or misconduct in the church. Child abuse is not the only form of sexual misconduct in the church. There are two others that I want to ensure that you recognize, including sexual harassment, that unwelcome, inappropriate sexual remark or advancement, and also clergy sexual misconduct, which are the sexual relations that are legal, but they're typically deemed unethical or improper in the church, such as adultery or the use of pornography. In a study by the United Methodist Church, they found that 75% of their clergy women and 50% of their lay women had experienced sexual harassment in the church. And this growingly was both men and lay people. So it's not just happening to our congregation, it's happening to us as well. What's the culture in that church? And then when we look at clergy sexual misconduct, again, there aren't a lot of studies that have been out there, but we're hearing about it more and more in the news. And so the studies that have been looking at cross Christian denominations have found that anywhere between one and 38 and a half percent of clergy have said, yes, I have engaged in this type of sexual misconduct. Sexual misconduct in the church is real. And whether it's child abuse, harassment, or other forms of clergy misconduct. It's something that we need to be aware of, and we need to think about that impact as we try to build a true culture of protection and a true safe church. So why are churches vulnerable? Well, if you think about it, it makes sense. In a church, we have close relationships. We encourage people to build that intimate relationship with God, and we find that by engaging with each other. We also know that we try to build trusting environments. We're sharing very personal, intimate types of details, which makes us vulnerable. We also know that churches provide immediate access to each other and to youth as well as vulnerable adults. Of course it does. Our doors are open. We want to welcome people in. We also know that as we look at the typical practices of churches, we think about how we're hiring. First and foremost, we're talking about numbers of volunteers that exceed the number of staff by multitudes. So how are we screening them? Are we looking at background checks? Are we taking references? Are we having conversations? 
probably not much of any of that. But if we're doing background checks and just background checks, even that isn't enough because only four to five percent of sex offenders will actually have anything on a background check. And then there's supervision. How do we supervise all the people who come through our doors each and every day, especially on Sundays or during big programming? And what about who we serve? I said, we are a hospital, we're a classroom, we're a sanctuary, the neediest of needies. These are very, very vulnerable people. That's who makes up our congregations. And those are the people at risk for abuse. And then finally, this inherent power differential. And again, something we don't talk about, especially not as pastors. But the reality is that when you come to church, you're coming seeking wisdom from somebody who we believe has this powerful nature of a relationship with God that we're seeking. They're looking up to pastors. It's not that we go into ministry for this to be the case, but it is a reality. And so recognizing that inherent power differential is one of the real primary calls, I think, that needs to be made to all of us in ministry or any type of church leadership. And just as there is so much vulnerability for sexual abuse to occur in the church, the impact of that abuse is tremendous. For the pastor or the staff, it's really distracting. It's really hard to focus on that ministry, focus on your call, lead the people in your congregation, because thinking about that victim is so devastating. For the church as a whole and the leadership body, as you think about insurance, this could be a jeopardy where suddenly you don't know whether you're insurable. Those million dollar verdicts that we're seeing in the news, it can be absolutely devastating financially. And then we think about how it's going to be the reaction in the community, loss of congregational Remember, certainly reputational damage, and at the end of the day, it threatens the very mission of the work that we're doing. Are you overwhelmed yet? Don't be. I'm going to show you how you can build a safe church by creating a culture of protection. This is the Presidium Safety Equation, and this is going to be a large part of what you hear from me. It's the foundation of all and the rest of this presentation. It's simple because it looks at abuse in a very systematic, scientific approach. In fact, it was created because Presidium looked at thousands of cases of child abuse. And they said, what's the cause and how can we prevent and how can we respond? And what it learned in the midst of all that is exactly what this safety equation in building a safe environment is about. Because you see, abuse doesn't happen for a multitude of reasons. It's not like a natural disaster. It doesn't just pop up. It occurs specifically because there is a breakdown in one of eight areas of operation. And you'll see those up on the slide. In fact, it may be something as simple as a policy. Do people know what's appropriate or inappropriate in their interactions? It could be that someone wasn't screened and they missed that opportunity to be able to, to not select that individual for a leadership role. It could be a lack of training. People are very aware of mandatory, mandated reporting, but are they aware of prevention, monitoring, supervision? How do we keep people safe? Are we looking for behaviors? Abuse doesn't happen in plain sight. And so really thinking how we can look at those suspicious or those inappropriate interactions or those policy violations, that's how we prevent abuse from occurring. So as we go through the rest of this, like I said, I'll be referring back to the safety equation. I've put the link to our website to the safety equation in the chat box so you can refer to it later because this is going to be part of what helps you in creating that safe church. Here's the good news. When you start to look at that safety equation, it's all around the reality that abuse is perfect. So you're sitting there, you're overwhelmed, you're thinking, oh my goodness, all these risks for my church, what's happening in my congregation? We need to turn that to the hope that is and always will be in our church. And that is around how we can protect those in our care, how we can protect each other, how we can prevent abuse.
Before we launch into the next section, let me remind you again to use the chat feature to ask your questions, and I'll do my best to answer them in real time. So now that you know the stats regarding child sexual abuse and its impact on the church, I want to turn to the words of Elizabeth Melendez Fisher Good, who said, it behooves us as the people of God to put our churches under a microscope and do whatever is necessary to make them the safe place that they are intended to be. So let's dig a little deeper and look at the elements that impact your church in becoming this safe place. When you hear me talk about safety, what you'll notice is I use words like clarity and commitment because I think that those are the starting points. How clear are your expectations? your standards in the church. And does everybody know that? Do they know what those expectations look like? Have you said what's appropriate and inappropriate? We all come from different backgrounds. And so if we don't state it clearly, people won't know. And how clear is it to your staff, to your volunteers, to your parishioners, that they have a role in the safety that exists in your church? And finally, how committed is everyone to build and be a safe church? As I said, I know that that can sound a little bit overwhelming, but it doesn't have to be. And let me show you why. It starts with an evaluation of your internal culture. There are simple questions, simple ways, like giving yourself a report card, if you will. For example, are my standards clear? Have I written them out so everybody would understand what my expectations are? Are the standards enforced? So am I equal, just in making sure that everybody's following them? Or do I give some, a little latitude? Does everyone know that safety is part of their job? Is everyone looking for those opportunities to say, hey, I don't think that this went the way it was supposed to go? or I saw such and such, or I experienced this. And then if they do speak up, do we take those warning signs seriously? Do I have employees reporting concerns? Or has it been kind of quiet? And then if people engaged, are people excited about what we're doing in the church on creating this culture of protection? Do they see that as a real goal? of who we are and what we're called to be. And then how are we taking all of that and institutionalizing it? And what I mean is, are we writing it down? Are we sharing it? Are we making sure that we're constantly communicating? Look at your culture and think about, where are you honestly on this journey? Are you committed to protect the church the way that we've called? To be? Are you committed to protect the way Jesus exemplified? So let me talk a little bit about why commitment is important and how this journey to commitment to protect starts to unfold. You see, many of us uh, find ourselves in a place of complacency. There's an ignorance, if you will. We deny that abuse would happen. It's why I spent so much time in the beginning sharing the statistics with you, giving you studies, giving you those real examples of what's happening in our denomination, in our churches, because we can't stick our head in the sand anymore. We need to be able to say, hey, those, those past successes alone are not going to keep us safe. It has to be something we're actively doing. But then something happens, and so suddenly we, we're like, okay, we're compliance. Check the box. We're meeting the requirements, the standards. We're focusing on how we're going to react to that abuse. We're relying on our trainings and on our background screenings. We're, we're you know, not maybe not doing everything, but we're, we got this going on. And we become very prideful, and that's compliance. And it's better than complacency, but it's not good enough. Commitment is a voice of humility. It's a voice from the top. It means that we recognize that things are changing all the time and that that call to protect is an ongoing call. We're using systems, approaches, standards, and resources and accountability to keep moving forward and making sure that we are in fact preventing, but we're always, always asking, 
what's next. And we're working with experts. We're looking at others to confirm or assist us in getting better. Because if we're going to build a cultural protection, it means that we're also going to have a commitment to making sure that we're continually examining and revising and getting better. So let me have you think for a minute with me. What are some of the questions that I need to consider on this? Well, I'm going to go back to my safety equation because, as I said, this is really an easy way for us to look at how are we doing. So does your organization have written policies that clearly define boundaries? Do people know what's appropriate or inappropriate? What about our training? Is it preventative or reactive? Have we examined what might be a high-risk activity or location, and what are we doing specifically about that? How are we responding? When you think about all of these questions, what are your biggest struggles here? What do you have well-established that's making a big difference, that you're like, we got this going on? And where are the areas that we don't got this going on? What are the areas we need to focus on? Because my guess is you have some of this down and you just are able to focus on some other things. But here's the good news. I know this is overwhelming, but as I said before, you're not in this alone. We're in this together. Remember, the insurance board has some amazing uh, references for you, resources for you, including Presidium. We're here to partner with you on this journey. So. Again, no, it's overwhelming. Remember, you can use the chat feature for asking your questions, and I'll be answering those real time. But I really want to give you some practical tools, practical ideas of the first few steps you can take on building this safe church. So let's start. Step one, establishing policies for clergy, staff, and church members. <sighs> policies. Ugh. Last thing that we do in the church. I don't know. I haven't really seen a whole lot of policies. Why are policies important? Remember, I said policies are about making sure everyone's on the same page. So define those boundaries. Make sure that people aren't confused as to what's appropriate or inappropriate, how they should be conducting uh, their interactions with each other. What's prohibited in the church? What's not acceptable? And make sure people know there is a zero tolerance when we start to talk about abuse. Those definitions, those policies, if you will, that's what it's about. It's about clarity. Then make sure that you've made that protection a priority, that you have not only had those formalized policies on what's appropriate, but you're also have policies and procedures on how to respond and how to report, both internally and externally. What do I do if I see something? Who am I supposed to tell? Everyone should know that. Take those warning signs of those inappropriate behaviors or those just little things and take them seriously. There's a whole continuum of responses. But if we don't take those low-level things seriously, then that's where abuse gets to start to seep in. And hold each other accountable. It's not just policies for one. It's policies for all. And then finally, communicate, communicate, communicate. There are so many ways to communicate these days. When we think about newsletters, when we think about programs, when we think about what we can speak from the pulpit, all of these elements are ways that we can make sure that our congregations know our commitment to protect, that they know their responsibility to be part of that, and they know where to find the resources around how to respond or how to report or what's appropriate. Step two. Develop a screening process designed to screen out high-risk individuals. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but again, I'm going to put in the chat some of the uh, links to some other resources. But know that background checks alone will never be the end-all, be-all when we talk about screening. And we shouldn't just be thinking about screening hired staff. We should be thinking about screening volunteers who have high access. In other words, those volunteers who are working with our youth and may not have a whole lot of other individuals around, or those volunteers that might be working with vulnerable adults. And again, how do we just make sure that we're really looking at all aspects? That might be 
uh, interview questions that are behaviorally based. So interview questions where we're listening for how they would respond in a situation. And as I said before, having that zero tolerance, it helps to self-select people when they know that a church is very clear, if you come here and you work here or you volunteer here, we have a zero tolerance for abuse. We are a safe place. They're going to self-select. They don't want to be part of that. They want to fly under the radar. And they don't ignore reference checks. Asking somebody about someone else, checking up on maybe where they worked before or other people who know them, just to see how they do it. How would they fit into this? How do they respond in certain situations? Again, we have a lot of resources that are available, both on the Insurance Board website as well as Presidium. Put those links in the chat for you. If this is an area that you need assistance, we're here to help you on that. Step three, train people with skills needed to recognize and respond to warning signs. Like I said from the beginning, this is a challenging conversation, and it's not one where people easily gravitate to what should I be looking for or how do I respond? And so making certain that we don't assume that people know this, we need to train them on what to look for. Make sure the content is right. Are you talking about those very descriptive, very clear, remember clarity, what are my policies? What should you be looking for? What's a policy violation? What's a boundary crossing? Those are the ways that we are preventative. Yes, we want to teach them how to respond with mandatory reports and those types of things, but you want to teach them how to look, how to listen, how to be in a space. When we're all doing that together, we are truly creating a culture of protection. And again, there are some risks inherent to ministries and churches. You saw that on one of my previous slides. Again, please make sure that you're thinking about where are those spots in my church? What are those programs? What are those areas of interactions that I need to really think about how I ensure safety? Think about that ease to access and use when we talk about training, because we know everyone has 100,000 things to do. So how do we make sure that we can fit this into their schedule and target the right people the right way? In other words, for leadership, do it in person. Those discussions that you have will be very, very fruitful. You'll be able to learn from one another. You'll be able to, to build scenarios to be able to use in the future in your trainings. Online for staff and volunteers, that's an easy one. Let them fit it into their own time, but make sure they know how important it is. And then make sure that it's an easy way for you to verify that it's been completed because compliance in training in these little things that you're asking people will also be able to indicate whether they're doing the big things that you're asking of them. Step four, supervise for safety. I know that sounds like we do that all the time. That, that That's just a given, right? Well, not necessarily. Again, as we think about monitoring and supervision, yes, we're thinking about that safety of the infant or toddler, but do we really do that with adults? Do we really do that with each other as we think about our interactions in the church? So first, think about a formalized monitoring system where you've gone through and you've looked at those high-risk conditions or the individuals. So again, it might be youth programming. It might be a, a grief support program or an addictions program that you have. What are those areas that you need to be thinking about? How will I just supervise it? How will I make sure it's safe? how the relationships are occurring in the manner that we have already outlined as appropriate. Then think about a system for monitoring the conditions or the individual. So are you looking at um, how you can do this in an easy way? It's not meant to be intrusive. It's meant to be just very innate. If we practice it, it becomes something that we just do very easy every day. Develop a method for documenting. And I can't stress this enough, even if it's just a checklist. Remind people what they're supposed to be looking for. So, for example, do I see one-on-one -on -one behaviors? Do I see an adult with a youth alone in a private space? Or do I see the door open and the windows uh, there through the doorway? Do I, am I able to see clear visual lines and hear what they're talking about? Because safety starts with the rule of three. One-on-one -on -one interactions are going to, to happen. But really, if you can, two adults per child is really the way you want to go. You always want to have two adults with any type of youth programming. And same thing when you're talking about some of the vulnerable interactions. 
put one-on-ones. That's part of our ministry. It's part of what we do. How are we going to ever be able to manage that? Well, again, how do you think about your monitoring in a different way? Do I have my door open? Do I have a window in my door so people can see through? Have I told one of my other staff persons that I'll be meeting with this individual so they can walk by and make sure everything seems okay? There are little ways to make sure that you have a, a method to report and to document. And as you see things that are working well or see things that aren't working well, that documentation helps you. Review it. Talk about it. What are the other things we need to consider in this? And trust me, there's a lot of gray areas that, that will come out. What about outside contact? Do, are our staff allowed to babysit or go to after-hour gatherings? How are we communicating electronically? Are we allowed to have dating relationships? What does all of these things look like? I know, it's a lot, but thinking it through now before it becomes a problem is really the best way for us to start on building the safe church, building this culture of protection. And electronic communication is one of the key areas that we're seeing at Presidium where youth to youth are in fact engaging in unwanted sexual interactions as well as things that lead ultimately to abuse. So they're important conversations for all of us. And then finally, implementing systems for reporting, responding. And as I said, we always want to think about our prevention aspect, but when we see something, we need to know how we report it and how we respond to it. So think about developing those written procedures so that people understand who should I be reporting to? What should I be reporting? We talk about responding to tremors and not earthquakes. And what we mean by this is that you want to be able to respond to those low level, those little things. So maybe it was just that you did see somebody alone in a room. That it was a, a secluded area where they really weren't supposed to be. Does that mean that there was abuse happening? No but it does mean that they broke a policy or they had an inappropriate interaction as defined by your standards. And so responding to those and making certain that you've addressed those become critical. Again, these are the way that we prevent. Response is part of that. Responding to those little things before it becomes a big thing. Refreshes, treating your near misses as free lessons. Again, that's a perfect example. So, so you found someone who was in a space where they shouldn't have been alone with a youth, that they shouldn't have been with that. You were able to interrupt. You had a conversation. You found out there were all these other circumstances around it. The near miss. So addressing it, making certain that you have said with both parties what was appropriate or not appropriate, those are free lessons. And being able to use those free lessons of how did that happen? How did they put themselves into that situation? And what can I do as a church leader to make sure it doesn't happen again? That's how we start to build that culture of protection. And red flag behaviors or low level violations. Again, those are the things that I just mentioned, breaking those policies, crossing those boundaries. Those are the things that you want to be able to address sooner rather than later. And we find them very often by responding to the things that we know just don't feel right. I always say that uh, my mother told me to follow your gut instinct. I think it's more than a gut instinct. I think that we have that small, still voice in us when we're really thinking about who we are and whose we are, and we're leaning in to our call to protect. It's really easy to hear some of those things for something to, to maybe not be crystal clear, but you know it's just not right. Address it. That's a red flag behavior. That's something that you need to consider. And then remove the barriers to reporting. And trust me, this is one where you will have to spend a lot of time. Barriers to reporting is something that takes a long time to start to tear down. And it really is one of those features of building a culture of protection that will be long on your list because it is very easy for people to see that reporting is something that is just uncomfortable. I'm loyal to the organization. I don't want to tell anybody. That's my best friend. I'm loyal to my best friend. I don't want to tell anybody. They start to think about, am I questioning the credibility or am I going to be questioned? They're worried about protecting that person. They don't even know what's right or wrong because no one trained them on it. They feel as though, oh my goodness, I may not have objectivity in any of it because it's a family member or it's a close friend or it's my pastor. They fear that they have to have proof before they say something. I always say, report, 
respond to what you see, you feel, you hear, you're talking about the behavior. You're not talking about the individual. And then here's the real one that you need to think about. Do you have a consistency policy and examples where people have come in and they've, they've talked about things and action has occurred? Because if people feel that they're not being heard, that, that things are not being responded to after they've reported or they've responded, they won't come back. They won't want to be part of that. So how do we think about those opportunities for one-on-one -on -one meetings, those times when we're trying to put these policies in place and how they could seem like barriers, but really we're trying to create a safe church? How do we turn those very challenging, uncomfortable moments and conversations and topics like this, sexual abuse in the church, and make it one where we have hope and we have forward momentum because together we're building something even better, called to be a protective organization, called to be a safe place, called to be like Jesus. So as you think again about this journey to a commitment to protect, I remind you that that continual evaluation of where are you on the journey from complacency to compliance to commitment is incredibly important. And there's four things that will guide it. Leadership your leadership, those standards, those clarity of those standards, those policies, those resources, things like training and communication and making sure everybody knows their role, and then accountability. Holding people accountable to follow your standards, holding people accountable to respond and to report. Those are the elements that will help to guide you along that pathway. I want to give you another thought before we go. I was reading in a devotional by Joseph Prince, uh, Meditation, that talked about the church is not man's idea, it is God's idea. It's a place where all the guilty, where all who are suffering from condemnation and where those who are being pursued can come and take refuge. Is that your church? I believe that there is a call to action with this topic. If we speak at the church as our refuge, our defense, can you ensure there is safety and protection in your church? This is a journey we're on together, the insurance board, Presidium, and you, and hopefully all of you together supporting one another. This question is one that we must be able to answer honestly. And we must be certain that we are building a culture of protection. As I said, you are not alone on this journey. There are resources from the Insurance Board website. Please take a look. There's policy templates. Safe Central has resources from Presidium because the Insurance Board has engaged us. We have academy with trainings and an assessment tool. We offer background checks. There's a case uh, which is called create, Creating a Safe Environment, all of these elements, these tools, these resources for you. Because we don't want you to go alone. We want to be able to be sojourners with you on this journey to building a culture of protection. So thank you for your time and attention. Please remember, questions can be asked not only of Presidium, of me today, but also of the Insurance Board of Presidium Beyond today. It's going to take more than one conversation, more than one presentation to find a way that we can be the church that we were called to be. But I do know that together it is possible.